Hey, hey, mori ora. Inga mana, inga reo, inga iwi o tamotu. E rangatira mai. Kia ora. Uh, tēnā koutou. Tēnā koutou. Tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, so I'm bringing greetings from New Zealand, Waitaha people from New Zealand. Uh, I bring you greetings also from Central Queen, uh, 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 Queensland Centre for Domestic and Family Violence Research in Central Queensland University. Um, and I bring you greetings to your leaders, to your authorities, to the people who look after the land here, and uh, to all and acknowledge all you people who work in these difficult circumstances and these difficult fields. Uh, thank you for your introduction. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I, uh, I'm, my name is Andrew Frost, as, uh, as I've been introduced. Um, my background is uh, I've, uh, I've been working in human services uh, since about the year 1764, I think it was. Um, uh, working with boys and men uh, with, uh, um, in a residential setting, residential social worker, did my training and background in social work, uh, worked with uh, uh, sex offenders, and uh, my current interest and heartfelt commitment is to working in the domestic and family violence field, uh, particularly in the men's behaviour change uh, facilitation uh, area of the sector, uh, which is where I'm teaching along with my esteemed colleague, uh, Zilke Meyer, who I'm sure all of you have met uh, yesterday. I'm sorry I wasn't here yesterday. Um, so, uh, I think I'll get underway. So this is the Podium Express. I've got 10 minutes, good luck to me, and good luck to you on a Friday afternoon, in the middle of the afternoon in the winter. Okay, so, um, yeah, my topic is domestic and family violence, and I, I wanted to talk particularly about the intersection between domestic and family violence, particularly men's behaviour change programmes uh, and, and addictions. Um, so, uh, I'll just flick down here. There we go. Uh, so, programs for men who use violence and domestic, uh, domestic and family violence relationship in domestic and family violence relationship that you read. Um, so, I, I, I'm, I feel a bit of an imposter in some ways and uh, in representing the field. Um, uh, but uh, I do teach into men's behaviour change facilitation and domestic and family violence at the university. So, these are these are new uh, new qualifications, and so um, I've been. Uh, 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 community with the, with the field, with the sector, and uh, I've learned quite a lot about what goes on here in, in, in Australia, and, and I guess bring some, some, uh, some knowledge and thinking from New Zealand as well. So what I want to talk mm. about really in, in the domestic and family violence field um, with respect to men's behaviour change, first place, is this notion of the centrality of power relations and coercive control. Um, so. Uh, there's been under, under uh, the whole domestic and family violence field, as I'm sure you're aware, in some ways, in the se similar ways, the addictions field has undergone a characterization shift um, in the last few years. Domestic and family violence was seen as being something uh, that was a, a, a family issue, a private family issue, uh, an issue for the man, an issue for the family, or even an issue for the, for, for the person who's been abused, the woman who's been abused and her children. And we now see this very much as a, a public issue. It's gone from a private yeah. trouble to a public issue. And it is uh, in, clearly a, a, uh, an entrenched, uh, a very, um, uh, an obstinate um, and enduring public health issue. Uh, and it is in the context of power relations. So power <laughs> relations about how groups take control of other groups in terms of their interaction with them. And it's, uh, it's seen very much, and I think very accurately, as a gendered problem. It is what men do to women and, and their families. So I'm talking about abuse here, and I'm, I'm, I'm in some ways uh, distinguishing it from the notion of violence, because lots of people commit violence. Some people use it systematically and abusively. I think this is the main problem with domestic and family violence. I say it's a gendered problem at heart, I think, and it is, it's <coughs> systemic. It's, 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 it's fueled by uh, uh, patriarchal dominance and the, the privileges that men have. But it's also in a broader context of oppression uh, and intersectorial um, relationship to other forms of oppression as well that is fueled by, by, um, uh, by colonization, by discrimination, uh, and, and so on. Um, 
So, uh, and so what we find in terms of the phenomenon itself is, is that, that at its core, it's about an entrenched and systematic abuse um, w within family systems uh, where a man is, is using his, uh, his um, uh, power and control uh, uh, tactics and strategies over a family. And the family live in fear because that. So we have terms like intimate terrorism, uh, of coercive control. So um, it gets to the point where the man merely needs to take the top off a beer can for his family members to start working, walking on eggshells around him. So I, I, what I'm talking about here is a systemic thing in the same way as we've been talking about addiction as, system, as a systemic thing, I guess. And in terms of cause and effect, um, we could, we used to simplistically say, so what caused this man to use violence? Or what caused this man to abuse? And I think the more helpful question that we're, has arisen now is, under what circumstances and in what context did this man choose to use violence against his family? So just moving on to, to, to the risk context then. So it's a simple it's a simpler it's a simple enough question what circumstances and context uh, was around that this man chose to use uh, violence against his family but the answers are quite complex of course so there's no simple cause and effect thing what caused this man to abuse but there are a range clearly of factors that intersect with domestic and family violence that help us understand what to target in intervention, in other words, in our programs and in behaviour change programs. So we talk, as people have talked to, today, about dynamic risk factors. So dynamic risk factors are important because they give us an indication of what to target in intervention. So these dynamic risk factors are things are, are, are that are, are, core, are, are related to the violence that we don't so necessarily they cause it, but they are related to it. <coughs> And we classify, we subclassify them into stable dynamic risk factors and acute dynamic risk factors. So, uh, a stable dynamic risk factor is something that's enduring, it's unlikely to go away, but it could go away over time, especially if we help it along its way with some sort of intervention. So, we might say here a significant and ongoing substance abuse addiction uh, is a stable dynamic risk factor. An acute dynamic risk factor might be the immediate implications of, of uh, current toxicity or imminent toxicity, so, uh, or, or an outburst of anger. That's a, an acute dynamic risk factor which can come and go. Now, that's useful to know that in terms of what sit, sort of situations the man might get himself into where these acute uh, risk factors might arise and the sort of situations he should avoid. Stable dynamic risk factors take a bit more work, obviously, and something that we tend to work at um, in, in programs. However, having said that, even some stable dynamic risk factors are more central to these intervention programs than others. And the most central ones I'm going to suggest to you are the ones that are related to this system systemic problem, the systemic public health problem that we have in terms of uh, men's power and control over women. So those central dynamic risks, stable dynamic risk factors are things like hostility towards women, things like a high commitment to uh, uh, male entitlement uh, and privilege, and the objectification subject, uh, and subjugation of women. They tend to be the central ones. So coming on then to how you're talking about these dynamic risk factors and the association with methamphetamine, say, and, and domestic and family violence, is that we could say that, um, uh, that, uh, that a, an, an enduring, ongoing, significant addiction problem is a significant factor, but it's less central um, than those other ones I was talking about because they are materially and systemically related to the, to the ongoing generic problem. Um, 
So, uh, and they're similar to, say, significant mental health uh, issues, uh, problem gambling, uh, impulsivity, another stable learning. So it's kind of similar to those, but it's not as central as these other things. So it might entrench domestic and family violence, might be a factor that entrenches it, uh, but it doesn't, if you like, drive it as such. And reductions in, uh, in addiction, reduction in the level and, and extent of addiction might mean there is fewer and less severe incidents, um, but it won't necessarily change the pattern because the pattern is something that the man has grown up with in terms of his cultural training, in terms of the support that he gets from the society around him, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so th that's what I, I mean in terms of the, of the centrality and the, and the distinction between the two things. So, uh, for instance, in New Zealand, we'll say, you know, well, the, 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 the reason for the upsurge in, uh, in domestic and family violence is because the All Blacks lost last night, yeah? Which, uh, you know, and, and there may, may be more, uh, you know, specific incidents, isolated incidents of physical harm, say, but it's not really going to affect that pattern that the man has established over, over an amount of time. So uh, just to move on then, if I've got a couple of minutes, just uh, in terms of a, a coordinated community response then, this is really where the alliance between, say, uh, addiction services and domestic and family violence service, men's behaviour change uh, services ha have got um, an, an overlay and a, an alliance. It seems from what we understand about the effectiveness of men's behaviour change programmes is it's very difficult to, uh, to determine how effective they are because it's hard to know what, what, what the results should be. And some people suggest it's, it's things like, well, improvements in the well-being of the woman and her children, improvements in, in their, their sense of liberty and so on, but it's hard to kind of measure these kind of things. Um, so... But where we do know that men's behaviour change uh, programmes are successful is in terms of their integration with other services. So other services uh, that they work with, um, uh, child protection organisations, uh, police, courts, uh, probation, uh, women's advocacy services, it's the system, it's the system re that response that is important here. The system matters. Um, so this includes substance abuse treatment services, and referrals from the men's behaviour change uh, programmes to referrals uh, to uh, addiction services tend to be to remove the barriers uh, so that that man can return to, to that, that service uh, um, and uh, undertake that work. So uh, just to kind of tie up, I suppose, is, is I think we need to think systemically about these things and the relationship between them rather than kind of direct causes and effect. I think it's probably my 10 minutes. Thank you very much.